<laughs> All right, welcome to the Poetry Vlog. Today I have a PhD candidate and um, amazing nonfiction writer, Jacqueline. Jacqueline, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Jacqueline, and I, like Chelsea said, am working toward my PhD. I got my MFA from Portland State, which is where we met. Yep. Um, I write a lot about illness. I experienced a neurological illness unexpectedly in college when I turned 18. Um, and I was a Division One athlete in cross country, so it kind of uh, changed my perception of myself quite a bit. So I like to kind of write into that and also spend a lot of time studying um, other people's experiences with illness, particularly women's. Um, so those are my main interests. Um, yeah. Outside of that, I really still love to run, <laughs> so <laughs> I run a lot. That's how I stay sane, I think, and I bake a lot, so yeah. those are my I totally hobbies. stole your hashtag, PHDO. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah. I feel like, like it know folds what out do. nicely. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and then, actually, before we started, we were talking about how one of the things we initially connected on in our MFA was this sort of like experience of being gendered as well as diagnosed when you have chronic illness. Mm -hmm. um, so especially when you come from a background of being a high performing perfectionist athlete and then having that kind of like completely change how you see your body and how you see yourself. Um, can you talk a little bit more about, cause you have a memoir, right? Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about what sorts of details you found you could include and exclude or how it like, physically and emotionally felt to have to go back into that space and write it because that's mm -hmm. something I struggle with like my poetry manuscript it, the line letters is kind of memoirish right it's about like being queer and having chronic Lyme and religion and all these different things but like mm -hmm. I have the like benefit in poetry of getting the sort of like exclude a lot because it's not officially a mm -hmm. memoir um, and yeah. I think sometimes it's a way of like avoiding or not, not avoiding, but not having to like sink into that, you know what I mean? Like go back into that place of how it felt. So I'm really like inspired by memoirists when you all like actually dig into those details and describe it and sit with your body in that. So how, how was that? I, I mean, it was really, it was really hard. Anytime I like sit down to write that section of my life, it's like, I have to, I, that's why I run after I write is just because like I have to come out of it in order to like teach and yeah. do my normal stuff um I think something that helped me though was that my narrative felt like it was taken from me in a lot of ways I don't remember my episodes when I have them so I come yeah. out of them and people will tell me what I did during the episode which is really disconcerting um and a lot of times I was taken advantage of and really um, scary ways by like former friends um, so for me writing the narrative like I actually interviewed a few of them which was really difficult and uh, yeah it was really painful but also then the ability to like take that back into my own language and shape it the way I wanted to and kind of give this um, it felt like I had power finally like I feel like I used to have control over like my splits and my mile times and like how I performed, but now I kind of have control over like, here's my story, here's how I'm going to shape it, here's the, what yeah. happened, even if I don't remember every single bit of that part. Yeah. So it kind of, yeah, it's like excruciating to write, like I, yeah. I'm glad for right now that it's on pause, but <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. it was like also like, I don't think I could have moved on with the rest of my life had I not written, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. like it kind of yeah. Nope, that totally makes sense. And just yeah. to backtrack, I didn't know this facet. So you interviewed basically like perpetrators to a certain extent. So you interviewed folks that took advantage of you during episodes? Yeah. They would like tell me to do different things and like uh, took videos of me and stuff. And then it was like a joke. And oh, I like God. tried to play along with it as if it was a joke because I didn't understand that this illness yeah. wasn't just like... I, I kind of was just, like, so baffled by the fact that my body was all of a sudden, like, this mysterious thing that I was, like, let me joke about it, because that's crazy, and, like, she can be, like, the ill one, and I, yeah. like, separated myself so that, like, there was part of me that was, like, nope, I'm still a D1 athlete, I'm fine, yeah. everything's cool, and this is a funny <laughs> joke, but, like, the yeah. more and more time that has passed, I'm, like, holy, like, I think I carry a lot of those experiences, like, in my body that, like, I don't consciously all the time I'm not like 
you know, that's not a memory I have, but I think that ways that I act toward people I care about now are shaped by that. What do you mean by you carry it in your body? I think, like, for a long, long time, I, I didn't, like, date anyone, which maybe sounds strange, but, like, um... I guess now when I come out of an episode and someone I care about deeply is near me, I immediately resort to like, go away, get away, go away right now. I need to be by myself. Where am I? And just go. Yeah. And so I think that like that reaction, I think that was like something innate in me. I don't think I was ever like a person who likes to be cared for, but yeah. I think it's especially like I wake up with like a kind of fear of like what just happened to me and who did something to me. And I, yeah. I've had a really hard time being able to like, I can now trust my cohort. If something happens to me in class, they'll all, like, make sure I get home okay. And it's, like, very – I feel very, like, cared you know, for. cared for. But I think that was something that I, like, didn't believe was possible because the way I'd been treated yeah. early on. So I think yeah. that that's – yeah. Yeah. That's intense. I actually didn't know that facet of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, interesting. It's interesting, too, that you, you talked about how, like, you would try to kind of – turn it into the humor as well and treat it as comedy. Our last um, episode, <laughs> I, I talked with my friend um, Safi along with her, with her friend Andrea, now also my friend. But um, <laughs> Safi's like a comedian, and we were all talking about Hannah Gadsby special. Have you seen the Hannah Gadsby special? No, but I want to so bad. I need to. This like yeah. totally resonates with that, about how like, yeah. you know, there's someone who's always at the end of the joke, and sometimes right. to get ahead of the pain of it, you put yourself at the end of the joke, but the sort of right. like excruciating pain that that actually reflects when you've been already taken advantage of, um, yeah. and how that actually is just like perpetrating in some ways the type of violence of being laughed at, um, yeah. or stopping trauma or freezing it at that point. Um, yeah, that's pretty interesting. which is really hard. It's interesting. Um, it's a different facet of it, but I thought the comedy part was interesting too. I'm like not funny and I'm not good with comedians. So yeah. I found it funny because I was like, oh, cool, this is like behind the curtains of comedy. <laughs> like what everyone else laughs at versus like my humor, you know? So, yeah. Um, so I want to segue then from that. Really exciting. Yeah. And actually, before I segue, do you have any publications that are like out or forthcoming or anything like that you can highlight in case people who are like viewing this are like, I want to read about like all of the things you're talking about or identify with it? Yeah, one of the, the Iron Horse Literary Review, I published an essay called I Remember, I Read, Read, Remember, because that's what I used to say sometimes while I was having an episode. Yeah. Uh, but it has, like, some of the transcripts of the videos that were taken of me during that time, and I kind of grapple with, in that essay, like, um, just going back and what it means to, like, view those videos yeah. again and things like that. Yeah. So I think that's the one that kind of relates, yeah. Would you be open to sending me the link to it, and I can post the link in the description so folks can, like, go read it if they're interested? Yeah, it's only in print, but I will oh, okay. definitely send the link to, yeah. How people can get a hold of yeah. the print version. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> For sure. cool. And I'm positive your memoir will be a success. I'm not even, like, yeah. I'm excited for your <laughs> memoir. <laughs> There's, like, so few memoirs on, like, chronic illness and being female and the sort of like taking control of your own narrative that aren't like yeah. older if that makes sense um yeah. or aren't like just poorly written and you're a great writer so I'm excited to read yours <laughs> <laughs> it's exciting um all right so segueing because how are we doing on time this is the thing I have to keep track of the most yeah <laughs> oh my god yeah we should get we should move along okay so okay. Um, talk a little bit about how this has informed your dissertation research and the books that are exciting you right now. Yeah, I have had the opportunity. I'm taking a literature exam in October, so I got to make a list with my committee of, like, 80 books related to women's illness and autobiography. Um, so one of the ones that I'm, like, obsessed with and I'll read again and, like, tout as, like, this is amazing is Tainted Witness by Lee Gilmore. Okay. And it's the subtitle is why we doubt what we women say about their lives, which is like everything I could hope for. Yeah. But she just approaches like with a feminist perspective. She says, um, she brings a feminist perspective to bear on how women's witness is discredited by a host of means to taint it, to contaminate by doubt, stigmatize through its association with gender and race, dishonor through shame, um, such that not only the testimony, but the person herself is smeared. And I just, like, like every yeah. sentence in the book, I was like, underline, underline, underline. Yeah. I felt like 
And it's so accessible. Like, I have some of these theory, like, more critical texts I've been yeah. kind of, like, uh, you know, a little yeah. bit intimidated by. But this one was one where it was just, like, readable and it yeah. felt great. So I really like that. Do you that have a it. selection you'd be willing to read from it? Um, I don't know if I do. One. I feel like there's a different one. You're like, that'd be better to read from than this one. Yeah, it could be. Um... Yeah, but I also have been really into Nancy Mares lately, which I never okay. read before this exam. I haven't read Nancy um, Mares, yeah. Yeah, she get she got diagnosed with MS when she was twenty eight. Okay. And um she is like fiercely feminist, which is awesome. Yeah. And she speaks about her illness in a way that's like really honest in the sense that she discusses her um hospitalization as a result of depression, but then also somehow manages to find a strain of hope that isn't just like and then yeah. I persevered and overcame. Like, nothing is like the, uh, Yeah, yeah. Which then you know. makes all of us feel ten times worse. Yeah. <laughs> like, but immediately it's like, it's like, oh, I guess I'm still failing. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, yeah. I, like, very much appreciated that. And she, like, talks about, you know, she has kids and she marries. And she, she like, just talks about subjects that, like, I feel like are usually, I don't know, not glossed over, but, like, yeah. made in and some what's way the, what's the title of the book she has i read plain text which are some essays okay, and then cool. waist high in the world um i also read one other one but i didn't bring it out here okay but <laughs> <laughs> this is my fault for everyone watching i was just like you know my like poetry vlog i didn't give any type of like pretext for <laughs> what we'd be doing so but yeah i appreciate this it feel like i can read a little bit it's cool she's like talking about how who she would want to be versus who she is, which I feel like relates to us in the sense yeah. of like what body used to I used yep. to have versus like oh, really yeah. yeah. So she says, um, like designers conceive tall, bony, pubescent bodies swinging down runways to some hectic beat on skinny but serviceable legs. And even the apparel that makes it to the outlet stores where I shop is cut for a life, erect form in motion. This is who I want to be, of course. And so I cruise the aisles, searching for a magic cloak that will transform me into her. The her I never was, and am not now, and never will become. In order to function as the body I am, I must forswear her, seductive though she may be, or make myself mad with self-loathing. And then she kind of goes on to talk about, like, how her body is viewed as broken or embattled um, by society and how she, like, disagrees with those labels that are imposed on her. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I just she thinks she's really great. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. interesting, too, because, like, I'd be curious if you've had this a similar experience, but something that, like, I've known I've struggled with when your chronic illness isn't, like, as visible is mm -hmm. there's, like, on the one hand, you have, you feel compelled to perform wellness all mm -hmm. the time to show people uh, that you have, like, conquered it <laughs> right yeah. and to be like accepted and not seen as like in any way abnormal but then on the other hand you feel like you need to like go ahead and make people aware that there's this grieving that you're constantly going through of what your body yeah. isn't anymore and also right. like communicate your limitations um right. and the boundaries you have to set around it and so it's kind of like a no win like no matter which way you go um it's like you either have to perform a certain kind of wellness, but then you're, like, not being honest or people don't understand what's going on inside. But if you talk about what's going on inside, you're seen as, like, whiny or weak or, mm -hmm. like, you didn't solve it or fix it or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've experienced anything even similar, but I know it's something that I've struggled with and why I don't talk about Lyme as much anymore sometimes even. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I feel like most of the time I, except for with people I'm very close to, I perform wellness all the time and then I think the other pitfall in addition to being seen as whiny when you when you like disclose is like I wrote the essay for the New York Times and I got 30 personal emails to my inbox and one of them was like if only you would donate a pint of blood a day you would be cured and then another one was like I know you have this and like the comment section was just like you are going to die if you go out there for a run. Like, you need to take care of yourself. And so part of telling people, like, yeah. I've struggled with eight years with this illness that, like, no one can seem to pin down in a way that satisfies me. It, like, invites people to be like, it's stress. It's yep. this. It's why are you doing that? Yeah, why yeah. can you do that? Have you looked at the weather? Have you looked at what you ate yesterday? And yeah. I'm like, what do you think I've been doing for eight years? Yeah. Like, I haven't been... <laughs> Around, like, yeah, you know, yeah. I don't know. So I think that's like 
Yeah. Yeah. I and get it, easily frustrated. Yeah. And it's like, it's another thing where someone's telling you what to do with your body and how to be in your body and they don't actually right. know what it's like to have your body. Right. So they have no right. Right. Um, right. Would you yeah. be willing to, and I'm putting you a little bit on the spot, so no pressure, yeah. but would you be willing to read some of your own work a little bit so people can get a feel for your writing? Sure. Okay. <laughs> it's like 10 second pause. <laughs> uh, sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm totally read, still like, drinking my morning tea over here. <laughs> Um, all right. My first division one cross country race began like any other in my life, a riding sea of legs and elbows, the sound of spikes thudding into dirt and competitors muttering, watch it. My limbs felt light as if they contained the hollow bones of a bird wing at the top of a hill, nearly a mile and a half into the three mile race, parents, coaches, and teammates yelled and jangled cowbells amid the clamor. I saw my dad, who had flown from Oklahoma to North Carolina to watch me race. Take your turtle shell off, he said in his quiet but fervent way. It was a cheer he had made up when I was 12 years old or so, after the two of us watched fox turtles climb an impossibly steep hill. With my dad's encouragement, I felt powerful. I moved ahead, girls, moved ahead of girls with slumped shoulders who breathed in gusts. I crossed the finish line triumphant, finishing third on my team and seventh overall. Before my dad returned home, we got ice cream, our post-meet ritual, and dreamed out loud of races to come. And then my illness hit soon after that. <laughs> but that gives some <laughs> tapes, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I love it. I think it's really exciting. And it's also, like, I just want to highlight that it's incredibly brave because everyone's competing with your narrative when you put it out there. So it's like this game of having to, like, regain control of your narrative. But also, like, the more you put it out there, the more other people try to take control back of it. And it's just like, let me tell my goddamn narrative. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah. Constantly. It's so true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. We're about out of time. So right. thanks so much. I really appreciate it. I'm going to hit end record. And for those of you viewing or listening at this point, this is my first time trying recording on Skype. So okay. she's been amazing with, like, having me slowly try to figure out the technology. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, we'll keep chatting afterwards. So I'll just like say bye to the Poetry Vlog folks and I'll edit out the rest of our conversation real quick. Sounds good. Um, so anyway, thanks for listening to the Poetry Vlog. Um, again, this is Jacqueline Alms and I'll link to some of her info down in the description um, so you can check out your work for your, her work, not your work, for yourself. Um, and then some of the updates are I'm going to be posting a conversation to the vlog about once a week for the next 20 weeks. Basically, they're all booked out now. Um, so I'm pretty excited about it and I'm really grateful that we've had the opportunity to talk about chronic illness and gender a little bit and kind of dip into creative nonfiction as also an embodied poetics practice. If you have any like comments, questions, requests, um, if you want to be featured because I'm open to anyone, you don't have to have a fucking book published, right? Uh, feel free to get at me on Twitter, twitter.com slash Chelsea Grimmer or view my contact form on my website or go to the general Facebook page where I kind of have the hub for all of these. Um, all right, that's it. Have a wonderful day.